welcome to another episode of Quarantine with Fulbrighters and I'm quite excited because the guest, much like me, has had a journey that's been all over the place. So let's discuss where he started from, where he ended up and how that happened. Mr. Anosh Mehdi, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing very well. Thank you, Shadat. How are you doing? Since we had already started talking before we started recording, what is the story here? You went for a PhD in computer science but ended up with an MS in computer science from the University of Illinois, Chicago. Yeah, so I, yeah, so I already had a master's in computer science from Zepis, and I applied for a PhD program at UIC. Uh, and I did go to UIC for the PhD with the whole intention that I want to do PhD in a human computer interaction like the you know, that was the specialization that I was seeking. Uh, but the year that I went into UIC, they changed their PhD program that instead of doing like a PhD qualifier, which I exam that you pass and then you continue with your PhD they had this new mechanism that you have to take a certain courses and you need to get, get certain grades and also submit like a partial small like a research thing and you had to like qualify for both criteria that your grades had to be above a certain grade and then you had to do a good uh, research so in my case what happened was that you know i did the best like you know for the courses that i was like inclined to do like the human computer interaction size the graphics and all that stuff i get very good grades but then there was another part for like computer algorithms, which is not my field, which is not my intended you know, subject. So I got a one grade lower than the expected grade. And then my research part, I did exceptionally well. So I was that one of those students that they were like, oh, in his fields, he's excelling. But because we set up this weird criteria that people have to get those certain grades, what do we do with this person? So I think my professor, like he fought for me. He's like, yeah, we cannot send this guy home. You know, he has worked hard, like in his field, he's doing well. So maybe we should give him a chance to like, at least, you know, move to masters and then maybe he can, you know, get something out of the program. So yeah, it was like that, you know, if, if I would have just had to do the, uh, the subjects that I was interested in, I think I was doing well, but just because of the other courses that I had to take, I think it hindered my progress, but you know, it eventually worked out. I did get the masters and I came back to Pakistan. So you've had a really, really interesting journey. You're now a principal consultant at Oracle in Chicago. So when we when we do these podcasts, especially with Fulbrighters, mashallah, they're so well accomplished and they've done so much that a lot of times when prospective students look at it, they might get inspired or they might also think we will never be this person. So I'm really interested in your journey. Uh, I believe you did your entire schooling in Hyderabad. So let's go back in time. How did you get interested in computer science? How did you move to Karachi to do your undergrad in computer science? Let's go back to Hyderabad and find out what your inspirations were. So to be honest with people, you know, like when I was in Hyderabad Army Public School, the first time they introduced the subject of computer science, when it was like all those MS DOS black color screen, I hated the subject. I literally hated that subject because, you know, it was like, it made no sense like looking at a black screen and you are typing some commands and something would happen and you know it made no sense but i think the main uh, thing changed when i think i was in eighth grade and my, the, the school got a like updated lab and they had these windows 95 pcs and the concept of looking like at a mouse and these colorful displays i was like wow this is some other world like out of my imagination like all the video game consoles and everything this computer thing like really blew my mind the other thing was that you know i have this uh, birth like by birth uh, thing that I, my fingers are missing but i can still you know move my hands and because that's how i press so one challenge was that people thought oh you can never use a computer because how are you going to type with one hand i said no i can use my other hand and so I think that made an, uh, another thing that, oh, I have to do well. You know, I have to show people that, you know, I'm not limited by, you know, by, by birth this thing and I can do well. So I think that Windows 95, those colorful screens, this, you know, this added another thing. And I was like, wow, I, I think I love this field. I have to somehow get into it. So as you said, yeah, I, I was in Hyderabad till, uh, till my intermediate, uh, but then I went to Karachi in Zebis and enrolled in the BS computer science program. I mean, for all the people who are in, ed in education listening to this, there's a lesson to be had. Uh, if you want to inspire children, teach them things that will inspire them. I believe there's schools still in Pakistan that are teaching kids MS-DOS, teaching them how to use a mouse, whereas kids are born with smartphones. Yeah, yeah. Now the world has completely changed, you know. And unfortunately, now... a lot of schools here still have it, though. 
Yeah, yeah. We were looking at the computer science, uh, the, the book that they are still teaching. It's like almost the same that we like studied. So it was like way back 15 years ago and technology has advanced like by leaps and bounds. So now, now that we're in Karachi, what new world uh, of computer science opened up to you in your undergrad? Oh, it was, it was a different challenge. Like first, like coming from Hyderabad to Karachi, first you have to like make friends. Like you don't know anyone. And the people in Karachi, they are, I think, uh, well exposed like they, they know the world a lot better uh, so I think the first challenge was to you know get get up to speed with the people in terms of computer science I think the good thing was that the Zabis had just turned from a three-year to a four-year uh, computer science program so that was the first time they were doing a four-year undergrad so that meant we had like access to a lot of different courses a lot of new computer programming languages uh, a lot of software development uh, and in addition to that, since it was a four-year program, they can add in some like management science courses. So that helped a lot because that made us understand that it is not just about the computers. You have to eventually go talk to people. You have to understand their problems. And that's when you will develop some good software for them. So that was a very good learning experience that, yeah, you, you need to be tech savvy, but you also need to go and understand the business side. So now that... Uh... Computer science is the new in thing, and that's what everybody's talking about. There are a lot of people who are shifting to computer science or who are getting degrees in computer science. Now that you have some distance from that undergrad, uh, Anush, what do you feel we're lacking? Or when we produce graduates at the undergraduate level in computer science, what do you feel they're lacking, which they really should have by the time they're done with their undergrad? I think a lot of people don't understand that, you know, if, if you know the computer sciences side well, and if you don't know anything about business, if you have not looked into any like problem domain, uh, then, then, then you will go into just like any software house and you will just work on what they are working like, you know, or you will just go into a, any big company and they will just make you work on something small and you lose your whole focus. I think during the undergrad, I think even I think we made a lot of mistakes, like we should have done more internships, we should have like as a collectivity, as a group, as a class should have worked on some software, some kind of application or something. Uh, I think one thing, uh, you know, so there are a couple of things I should add as well. One thing I learned in America was that here in classes, people don't just look for their friends. If they have a good idea, the four or five smart people of the class, they will make a group and they will go for that idea. They would not care if their other friends will suffer because they are not helping them. Something that I find different in Pakistan is that people make very close friendships within the class and they would ideally just want to work together as a group and just progress through that class. So the best brains in the class don't necessarily work. I, I got lucky that, I... that all four or five of my friends in undergrad did not want to do anything. So we collectively made a group and failed together. So <laughs> at least we had that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I think that is different. So I mean, yeah, honestly, like that, that makes a huge like change in perspective because we did the same thing. Like we had a close group of friends. So we had to like, you know, work together and try to make sure that everybody passed through those subjects. But that meant that some of the other people in the class, we never worked together. Like even in four years, we might have done maybe one or two projects just because the teacher assigned us that, no, this has to be this random group. What I saw in America is that if you go do your first presentation and people find, oh, these people are smart, they will say, okay, let's stick together and let's try to, you know, make the best possible outcome of this class. We don't care how everybody else is doing, but with our like potential, we need to go and make the best thing out there. So I think this will be a little bit of a cultural change that, you know, sometimes you might have to sacrifice your friendships if you really want to break the barriers. If you want to, like, push yourself, you would have to work with other people. And it is also tricky. Sometimes when two smart people work, there will be clashes of ideas and you might not necessarily get along. But that will happen in real life. Like, when you work at an employer, you will find some other smart people there. So I think that whole thing needs to change at, at that undergraduate level. That felt like really personal advice because you also worked at a software company after graduating. So I have worked like, you know, my uh, my journey, I worked at a semi-government organization. It was an oil and gas company in Pakistan when I uh, graduated. Then when I came back to America after the Fulbright, I worked at a software house. And then I worked at a, at a government uh, bank. I worked at State Bank before I moved to America. So I when, that, when we think of technology and advancements and modern technology, we think State Bank of Pakistan. I mean, like, see, the State Bank of Pakistan was interesting because 
when, when even when going, I thought, oh, they would be super advanced. Or why is it the Pakistani banking industry not progressing as like compared to you know U.S. banking? Uh, I think yes, there have been delays. I think there is no, risk taking is very tricky, and I think budget allocation. One thing that is bad in Pakistan is that in most companies, IT is still considered as a support department, which uh, hinders their progress. Like they cannot just go on and ask for huge budgets. And unfortunately, like uh, the Pakistani, like the rupee value, because if you buy a software, it will, if you buy want to buy a nice, good software, like a decent software, it will run into hundreds and thousands of dollars or maybe a million dollar project, which for Pakistan is a huge budget. Not many companies would want to invest that much. So that also limits the IT department. Then they are stuck with like partial baked softwares. So at State Bank, I think when I went there, I was lucky that they had some decent budget. And there was like the government, like the top management was involved in that project and we pushed through and we were able to like deploy that within that intended time period. So I think I was lucky that when I went, there were funds there. And now I think with their new uh, funding from uh, that uh, Gates Foundation, they had this RASP implemented. But yeah, there are a couple of challenges. They need huge funds, like companies need to understand you cannot do a nice, great or like a successful IT project with a limited budget. You need to understand that IT is a critical part of your business. Is it just funds or is it also personal? Because you hinted at risk taking. I've also found the banking industry in particular in Pakistan to be very, very risk averse. And it's very easy to pin the responsibility onto somebody else. If you go to private banks, they'll pin it on state bank. If you go to state bank, they'll pin it on private banks. And the ball keeps going between the two and the work never really gets done. And once you start using banking in another country, you think you're in a different world, even if things as simple as PayPal or Venmo that are part of everyday life, uh, we're still uh, in the process where I need six signatures to get one of my own checks processed through my own bank so that I can pay people my own money. Yeah, that, that is like, that's a, that's a different, it's like, yeah, you're right. When you look at banking in America or any other country, you are like, yeah, you, you, the customer is the, you know, treated very well. They treat you like you, you have, you, you are putting in the money. So they will treat you with respect. In Pakistan, that is a, a cultural thing because banks think they are the powerful players and they will you know take and decline any person if they don't want to you know do business with them they will say oh yeah we don't you don't have enough documents and we will not open an account for you or something because uh, it is like a problem with the banking itself the private banks because they know that there are not many other players coming in so there is not going to be any further competition for a state bank, yes, they should do a little bit more on this aspect that they need to come up with some more clearer policies and they need to go after the banks and like, you know, resolve these customer complaints, like set up some kind of a benchmark. So it's a little bit fault from state bank that they, they, they don't go hard at these banks. And for the banks, because they know there is not much competition coming in. So they are like complacent. They're like, okay, our business is still running. So why should we make it? For the better. Is it just that people are averse to taking risks, or is it also that personal that maybe did not um, get into the industry at a time when technology was this advanced that they are also afraid of technology taking over? For instance, in the US, you can take a picture of the check and that check gets deposited in your bank. Whereas in Pakistan, even the automatic check deposit machines are never working and you inevitably have to fill a form with pen and paper and then go to the teller who matches that signature and then clears the check. So is it just that the personnel at the bank and higher ups uh, did not grow up in a world with advanced technology themselves, so they're not implementing it? Or is it just they're just used to the old systems and they don't want change? It's, it's like both things. So yeah, of course, they never saw these advanced machines. So they don't understand how easy and convenient it would be for the customer if they allowed them these machines. The second thing is our culture. Like people are risk averse. People are still, like Pakistan, we still consider a mostly a cash-based society. Some people also like to do everything in cash. And if they have to use bank, they want to make sure that everything was signed and went through because uh, nobody wants to get into any kind of fraud scenarios because then it will be very hard to recover your money. So it's like the way people are brought up, they don't understand that, you know, if you make right uh, 
take some risks, like you should advance your technology. Of course, there will be few cases where it will go wrong, but eventually it will pick up and you will get to uh, like at par with the other countries. So yeah, people need, it's risk aversion. You need to teach people, you know, there is some literacy issues, but yeah, with banking, yeah, th there is a lot that needs to be done. Do you see a technology revolution in banking? Because there's so many apps that are now emerging that are for the unbanked. And a lot of people find them a lot more convenient to use as opposed to going to the bank. Do you feel they can actually cause a dent into the market of banks or are they too small uh, to make any difference? So like, uh, see, the, uh, some of these apps like uh, J Jazz Cash or Easy Pesa or like some new fintech companies coming up, they will make a dent, but they will need some time to grow and mature into those like have that trust that people will think, oh, instead of going to a conventional bank, I should just use this app because it is making my life easy. So at least, at least it is a good thing that the state bank has allowed those fintech companies to come up and start operating. Uh, but the journey will not be easy. They will need to build that trust. They will need to penetrate the market. And again, in Pakistan, like if you are either only restricted to urban cities, uh, then you have a limited audience. But the majority of the uh, the cash flow is outside of the cities in the rural population. So you will need to look at some examples from our neighboring country where they really focused on their rural uh, population. And they like, because the thing is, a software developer doesn't want to go to the rural city to understand. Like a people living in a big city, they would really make that effort to go and travel to a small city and understand what the problem is. You know, so that is somebody will need to actually go on the ground and understand and then come up with an app. So it will take some time. No, you're absolutely correct. But I guess once the tech exists, uh, it will work just as well for somebody sitting in Sarkoza as it does for somebody sitting in Karachi. You've mentioned India, uh, Bharat Pay is worth billions of dollars at this point. But they're also, I believe, now applying for a banking license. So maybe the eventual goal is to get all these customers on board on the app and then become a bank. Yeah, because banking, of course, they want to have another challenge because with, with their model, they want to earn on interest because they just they don't just want to do payments. You know, they also give loans to these small shop owners mm -hmm. and then they make money over some interest. So I think for them, it makes more sense if they get that banking license. And I think they did get that banking license. So now they can eat, like also like A, they can make money over these transactions through their QR code, but they can also make money over that interest. So if they give a loan to a small shop owner, you know, they know in a year or two years time, the shop owner will return it. But during that period, they can make that interest and then use that money somewhere else. So I think they have two, two goals that they are trying to cater to. I think in terms of loan repayments, they have a great model that they charge a very minimal amount, whether that's a rupee or two rupees or three rupees per day. And since all the transactions for that little shop are going through Bharat Pay, it all just automatically happens through the system. Uh, if we come back to your journey, uh, you did a master's in computer science from Pakistan, and then you ended up as fate brought you you did an MS in computer science. How would you compare the two? On the face of it, it seems like these are just two masters in computer science. But what would you say the American MS in computer science gave you that a master's in computer science from Pakistan was not able to? So they, they were completely different programs. So the masters I did from Zabist was more research-based thing. So we were like uh, writing research papers and we were learning how to do research, do write research critiques and a thesis. So it was more... Uh, research oriented, like we were not really doing hands-on programming, at least for the uh, software engineering one that I did, but it gave us an idea of how to look for research papers, how to write the research paper, and you know, it was more in that sense. The American was, was completely different because it is like very hands-on experience. Uh, they will give you individual projects. If any professors would want that you will do three or four individual projects in a class because they want to test how good you are. And then maybe a final project would be with a group just to see you can work with other people. So it was a lot of computer programming that I don't think I had done even in my like professional life at that oil and gas company because you know we had a different kind of a job. So it really challenged me that I had to really go. It was kind of like doing an, another undergrad. It was that tricky, at least in my experience. And uh, uh, again, it was like uh, the technology is completely different. 
So I did a human computer science interaction. So the first class I took, there was this visualization lab and it is like a almost 12 feet wall, which is a touch based interface. I've never seen something like that in my life. And they're like, yeah, you have to write a program that needs to work on that 12 feet wall and it has to be touch based and it, you know, go and design and it should be uh, such a design that person sitting at the end of the hall should also be able to understand. And I was like, wow. So the technology aspect was completely different. Uh, we did the same game development there and the idea of how to utilize the 7.1 sound system with the whole uh, big screen and you know how to design for that was completely different. Like I think, I don't think even in Pakistan, even now, like seven, eight years down the line, I don't think any Pakistani university would have that kind of a, a, like a lab. I, I doubt it anybody would have such a, a touch instant, like such kind of a display screen working in Pakistan. Do you so, feel like it's a cultural thing or was it program specific? Because I also feel like during my master's, when I went for the Fulbright, you were treated more so as an equal. Even when you're talking to professors, they talk to you like they're talking to an equal or somebody who will be in the same field uh, rather than that strict distinction or notions of respect that exist in Pakistan. I haven't done a master's in Pakistan, so I cannot say for sure if there is any different. Uh, but the fact that they threw you in the deep end you feel like that was specific to your program or is this something cultural that we also need to adopt where we treat adult students as adults as opposed to just uh, the same as undergrad students are treated? Yeah, so I think it varies from program to program, but I think in general, in, in American education, they, they would treat you as an adult and they would challenge you that, yeah, if you have come for a master's degree, we expect that you know something already. You have some you have learned already something in the undergrad program so we are not going to teach you those basics again there are libraries and lots of content in the internet if you want to brush up on those subjects you can do that so yeah they treat you uh, at a more uh, higher level you know they won't spoon feed a lot of things they will just give you some basic concepts and then they will throw you uh, into that you know now learn on your own uh, also, as you said, in terms of respect, yeah, they will treat you as an adult. They will give you that equal vote. So if there is some discussion going on the class and if anybody comes up with a nice idea, professor would appreciate that. And let's say if he was wrong, uh, he would accept it on, on, on the same point. Like he would not hesitate to say, oh yeah, my idea was wrong. And now I understand what problem that could create. So yes, you have a very good point. And they will be really happy that somebody, you know, uh, figured something nice out of it. In Pakistan, I think we still have that uh, a level of a difference. Like, you know, the teacher has to be right and, you know, you cannot just directly go and question them or argue with them. Uh, I think, it again, not, you're not going to generalize, but yeah, generally some professors would not be happy if you just, you know, in, in front of 30, 35 students, you just say, oh, sorry, your idea is wrong. You know, they might be happy if you go to their room and then say, sir, you know, I like your idea, but I think you can tweak it a little bit. Then they might be open to that critique, but not maybe in front of the other 30 students. But in America in general, yeah, teachers are happy to listen to your feedback because they also want to learn. They, and they know the younger generation coming might come up with some, some nicer, better idea. So, you know, they are open to learn. That's an absolute great quality. If a professor enters the class with a willingness to learn, some things I realize are just cultural and they're beyond whether which one's right or wrong. For instance, even 50, 60 year old professors in America would expect you to call them by their first name. And even as a Pakistani student, when I went, I was a bit uncomfortable initially calling a 50 year old professor by their first name. Uh, something that would not fly for most people in Pakistan, even as the students might feel uh, awkward if you start calling an old professor by their first name. But that's something cultural. I don't think there's a wrong or right over there. Yeah, of course, that, that was a yeah, tricky thing. As you said, calling a professor, he says, like, yeah, don't call me dear sir, or don't write in the email, just write Andrew. And I want to do this project. I'm like, wow, this, it doesn't ring well with me. But And it happens with me right even now in the organization where I'm working at Oracle, Calling like a, you know, as you said, 50 year old boss by their first name, I still feel like uncomfortable. But as you said, maybe it is their culture. They, they don't want to go into that dear sir or dear manager kind of a thing. I, some things are just cultural. Even when I'm being heavily critical of somebody who is old on Twitter or on social media, I tend to add mystery. I tend to add sahab, uh, even though I'm <laughs> criticizing them. But uh, just certain notions of respect that come with age. What were some of the key takeaways or what did you learn uh, specifically 
during your time at University of Illinois Chicago that you were able to bring back to Pakistan? As I said, so what I learned is that you know there is uh, so since I worked in that human computer interaction or uh, human interface design, a lot of design elements. You know how how do you make a good web page? Like how do you make it easy for people? You know, so when we're doing this project at State Bank, where we had to design uh, something for the banks to use, and for, you know, uh, there were a lot of ideas that we had to put in through. Because one thing was that, they, uh, like generally, some if you look at state websites, they are full with information. There are so many like links am, and so. <laughs> I'm shocked that that was even a discussion. The fact that our government websites or even banking websites even think about user experience or UX is coming as a shock to me. Yeah, so because at first it was like, yeah, it should look similar. But the good thing I think is that our boss, like my immediate boss was, you know, they had this idea that, yeah, we, I don't want to make it look like a, any other government organization, you know, even though it will be used mostly by the banks, but we still want to make it easier for them. And the software vendor that we had, good thing is that they were on board with it. They were willing to do this whole UX, UI design cycle because it costs money. If you make one website, it is not good. Somebody will critique. The color is not right. The buttons are not right. Somebody has to go back, work on it, and they have to present it again. So that cycle continues. So of course, it costs them money and time as well. But the good thing is they were willing to do it because they were like, yeah, we wanted to make it a very you know, user, like easy to use website. So that helped because that, that idea of how to work on these user interfaces helped. Uh, other thing, of course, from the programming and the business perspective, you need to think about all the different scenarios. As I said here, when they push it, uh, when they would give us a project, there will be an open critique that anybody can ask you a question. Oh, did you think about this scenario? What happens if this happens? So then when you are sitting in those meetings, you are like, yeah, but let's say if I'm working on a website and my mobile, like I don't get that one time password, then the whole thing is stuck. So you need to have it on the email as well, you know, as a backup, because you cannot just say oh, the, the cell phone will work all the time, you know. So you tell them that no, even if it adds cost to your overall project, you have to have those, you know, different parts for that. Even a simple thing as a one-time password thing. So you you tell them that no, you have to think through different scenarios. You cannot always look at the perfect scenario and say yeah, this is it. So, I'm yeah. sure. Uh you might be referen uh, referencing a particular incident because there is a famous bank that famously only sends OTPs to iPhones and is not able to send it to Androids. I don't know how, how they are doing that, honestly. It's like uh, <laughs> we have to think so, about So that. you have to be an iPhone user if you are to use digital banking for that bank. Wow. So it's like they are catering to a certain segment yes. in the population <laughs> only. Yeah. I mean, if they had advertised that, I would say give them some respect, but they don't. It's just when you try to use their digital banking, that is when you find out. So since you're doing uh, human and computer interaction, how soon before uh, the AI takes over? Uh, AI honestly is not my you know field because it's like a very buzzword thrown around everywhere. But I think a lot of industries are not at that point where they would leave it everything to the computer. A lot of things would still have to be uh, manually with some some intelligence to it like you know but like i so i work with an oracle i work with the utility industry mm -hmm. something that i did in pakistan as well for a, a few years so i work in the utility industry uh, at the energy and water sector so i think at right now the main focus is moving companies from their uh, on-premise platforms to cloud based uh, based platform I think that is the main thing that is going on in the current few years. Maybe the next step would be where you plug in AI into those uh, those markets. So as a growing market like Pakistan, which AI or IT or is still something is still considered new over here, what are some of the things that we need to focus on at a governmental level or a state level, which will leap forward Pakistan into the next generation? The first thing is, as I said, the cloud-based thing, the Pakistan, as far as I know, uh, I think even the state bank and some other like government agencies, they don't allow you to uh, work on a cloud-based platform. Uh, they don't want their data to be stored in these uh, cloud uh, uh, companies uh, like uh, servers. I think they need to look into it because if you don't open your country to that, you know, if you don't allow like big players like Amazon, Microsoft, Oracle, or anybody to come in and build cloud uh, infrastructure in Pakistan, you will be left behind. You know, 
So you have to be open to that idea. You cannot keep buying servers and putting them on your premises and maintaining them because it is a lot of cost to maintain them uh, in terms of electricity, personnel, you know, their security and everything. I think first step would be to at least move towards the cloud. You know, at least understand that, you know, not every company in Karachi has to have its own data server. Yeah, you, the government needs to be a little open, you know, open. Of course, right now, the cloud infrastructure is either in India or Singapore or Dubai, you know, they don't have infrastructure in Pakistan. But when we talk to companies here, they are like, yeah, the government is not willing to open up. And, you know, mm -hmm. and if they don't give us a guarantee that they will give us that initiative to build cloud infrastructure in Pakistan, we are not going to invest millions of our dollars and then let know that, oh, they don't want us to uh, utilize that. So government needs to understand that, yeah, you, you will be left behind if you don't switch to something more modern, at least in terms of cloud, and then you grow forward mm -hmm. with the, with the uh, advancing country. Hopefully the powers that be are listening and there's definitely a discussion to be had. I do believe a healthy skepticism of big tech is not that misplaced. Yeah, yeah. I hope like, you know, I hope somebody like realizes this sooner than later. Are we, are we, uh, are we being overly protective to be skeptical or to be afraid of big tech or is it just something that's here now and the genie is out of the bottle? I think it's not we are afraid. It's just that uh, our like lots of our industries have never had, you know, they have progressed without the tech mm -hmm. and they think they can continue to do so. Uh, but they don't realize that if you, if you want to make an impact in the bigger market, like at the worldwide stage, you will need to use technology. You know, you cannot just rely on cheap labor to keep working because eventually the cost will, uh, you know, be higher than what other country can provide, right? So nobody is going to give you an order. So I think the newer generation has to understand that at some point they will need to adopt technology. You know, they will need to, somebody needs to take that first step, you know, and that I like, you know, we look at this uh, idea of lens cart, you know, the Indian tech who makes eyewear. I mean, that guy's idea is nice that, yeah, you, you can, I can get a very cheap, like, you know, glasses in, in Karachi is that Bolton market in that neighborhood, you can get uh, like eyeglasses made for $1, like less than $1, $2. And they can even make that glasses within a day, right? But everything is manual. You know, and the quality is not the best. Like the sunglasses, the glasses that they make me today might not be the same they make tomorrow. But there is a huge potential. Those guys understand this whole uh, eyeglass industry. But maybe somebody needs to go there and put that tech, make it more. Uh, you know, instead of doing the whole manual thing, maybe make it a bit more uh, computerized or not computerized, like uh, industrialized. And then you can compete with you know other players. So. In the India, I think that somebody was willing to take that risk, you know, they, and they changed the whole uh, glassware, uh, eyewear industry in India. So somebody in Pakistan, maybe you did a brilliant that. job with lens card. I think now they've even managed to digitize it to such an extent that they can figure out uh, the number of the lens digitally, which initially yeah. they had to still do physically. And I can just order a pair of spectacles on the website. And if people are to read more about the sunglasses industry, they will realize that the product itself is very cheap to make, but certain yeah. companies have a monopoly over it. So which is why and the it, big few companies own and they keep the price of sunglasses where it is, which the product in terms of what it costs to make does not justify. Yeah, it's the same in America because see, in America, it's always like there are a few big players, you know, they make these glasses. And again, in America, you need a big capital to like, you know, come against them. You will have to invest a lot in marketing and stuff. But I'm, I'm sure somebody smart here will look at what Lenskart is doing. And maybe in a few years, somebody will also come and change the industry here because here eye classes are very expensive. I mean, even with insurance, they cost a lot. And of course, and when I tell my cousins back in Pakistan how much a glasses cost here, they're like, wow. I'm like, how much does it cost? How much, how much do those cost? <laughs> oh, the ones you're wearing. So these ones, the, their pr uh, price is $750, out of which, I, I don't know why, and out of which the insurance covers like $500 or $600 and rest I have to pay out of pocket, but they have nothing like very fancy out of, I mean, there is some fancy thing is that yeah, if, they, if, they, if I go into the sun, they will turn, you know, darker, and when I come indoors, they will turn like transparent again, but That's quite I fancy. still don't think, 
<laughs> yeah, but I still don't. <laughs> but I still don't think that cost like seven hundred dollars is a huge money, even for like a person earning. Like even let's say insurance is taking care of five hundred, six hundred. But I still think there is a huge profit that they are making here. And again, they know that nobody is going to come and challenge them. Absolutely. I think the American insurance industry is a much bigger topic and a podcast. Yeah, yeah. But thank you so much for coming on today. For all the prospective uh, students who are thinking of maybe applying for a Fulbright in computer science or looking for a career in computer science, what is some advice that you will give to them? What should they look at? What field do you feel like there's a lot of scope in, as we say, in Pakistan? So I would say that, you know, when you look for a Fulbright program, you should know what kind of degree you want. And because there are so many different, like, you know, universities and not all of their programs are going to be good like like uic they have a very good human computer interaction lab because they invested in it then there will be some uh, universities that might have a very good ai or natural language processing department some might have a very good uh, uh, networking department or something so you first need to realize what kind of a degree you want to do like what kind of a field you want to specialize in look for those universities that where they have a specialization or lots of professors that who teach in those departments. Uh, in terms of like few fields, software engineering is, is still very hot. All the big companies, they still need good software developers. So if you are a pure programmer, if you are very good at writing code and you want to make uh, like improve yourself, get better at it. So pure software engineering degrees is always gonna be in demand. If you are going for buzzwords, then yeah, AI, natural language processing, you know, you can go into those fields. Computing, gaming, video games, very diff difficult thing to do. It looks very easy. It is, I think, one of the most difficult classes I have taken. Computer, like video games it are like, think making movies, but making movies playable. That's how hard a video, uh, you know, game, video gaming is. So if you are really into that, there are some programs that will teach you that. So, and, and gaming industry is gonna grow. It will continue to grow. So that is another field. I don't think there are many uh, Pakistani software houses that excel in uh, gaming. Mm. Uh, so yeah, computer security. Again, you know, there are lots of like these threads, ransomware and stuff. So if you are into computer security, then there are some courses, courses that are specialized in that. Yeah. That's great advice to all the gamers out there. Thank you so much, sir, for your time. And thank you for listening. We'll be back again next week with another Fulbrighter on Quarantine with Fulbrighters. Thank you for listening. Take care. Bye-bye.